online with us. Appreciate you joining with our ministry today. All right, make sure nobody is missed. Make sure that everybody gets a very welcome good morning today. Morning. All right. Well, you may make your way back to your seats this morning if you can. We'll have more at the conclusion of our service to chit-chatter. All right, a couple very uh, quick but important announcements this morning. Of course, on Wednesday, we have our Wednesday evening prayer together at 7 p.m. All right, make sure that you remember and uh, do what you can do to join us. Um, I'm going to call Derek up at this time because he's going to give uh, the man an announcement pertaining to uh, December the 2nd. All right, so all of the men, make sure that you listen. I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Praise be to God. On December 2nd at 9 o'clock, the men will be gathering at 538 Dalhousie for a time of fellowship and some food. So what's happening on the second, second at 9 o'clock? One person is coming. One person got it. There's two people. Do I hear three? Do I hear three now? So it's just a time to get together as men and enjoy each other's company. And as, as Scripture says, iron, or iron sharpens iron. It's a time to bond, a time to get together over, over good food and good fellowship. And uh, maybe a cup of coffee or two. Yeah. yeah. Amen. We should get Derek to take up the offering auction style, shouldn't we? How many of you would be fans of that? Yeah? Okay. Now, the ladies, I'm told uh, that you guys as well, same day. So next Saturday, as the men meet at 9 o'clock there at that Dalhousie address, which we'll make sure to send out to you so there's no confusion. Uh, the ladies are meeting at 12 p.m. here at the church. Um, and you guys are having lunch. We're having breakfast. You guys are having lunch. And the ladies, I'm told to tell you that you are supposed to bring a gift. This is your closing for the, uh, the end of the year. And you're supposed to bring a gift. Don't ask me for more details. That's the details that I was given. Okay? Ladies at 12, lunch, bring a gift this coming Saturday. Men, nine, meet at Dalhousie for breakfast. No gift. Men, no gift. Ladies, they bring a gift. They're a lot more thoughtful, hey? Okay. And then uh, next Sunday, say next Sunday. So next Sunday after church, we're going to have our uh, Christmas um, banquet or Christmas lunch, whatever you want to call it, at the conclusion of our service. We'll go down to, uh, to the gym side there and we'll have lunch together, okay? So make sure that you, uh, you don't make any lunch plans if, uh, if possible. Next Sunday, plan to be uh, with us as the body of Christ down in the gym. All right? So that's next Sunday. So uh, next Saturday and next Sunday, you can tell we're trying our best to, um, uh, you know, I guess prioritize, but also uh, get out of the way a little bit of the busyness of December. Because we all know we've been there, done that, where we, uh, we have uh, dates planned and structured in the teens of December. And next thing we know, uh, nobody can make it because everybody's got work banquets or family early Christmas or whatever, right? So we'll try and uh, get it early and, um, and then we're, we got that box checked. Then you have your time. All right? Let's stand as we, uh, as we take up the tithe and the offering this morning. Let's pray together. All right? Father, we thank you for this morning, God, as always for the opportunity to come and to return the tithe and to give above and beyond in the offering. God, as many of the songs that we sang this morning, we give you thanks and we acknowledge who you are in our lives, what you're doing, and our gratitude towards you, God. And we're so grateful, as your word says, to, to bring cheerfully, Lord God, and to give cheerfully, Lord God, in the offering. And we thank you, God, for all the provision, Lord Jesus. As was mentioned today, we could be so many other places than found healthy in your church this morning. So many other things, so many other uh, options that people are, you know, enthused with today, Lord God, outside of your church. 
But Father, here we are, and we thank you for that, Lord God. We thank you for continuing to bless us, Lord God. We thank you for all of, of the things that at times we forget to uh, say thanks for, Lord God. Roofs over our heads, food on the table, food in the cupboard, Lord God. We say thank you. Thank you for good health, Lord God. Thank you for, you know, our houses and our vehicles, Lord Jesus. Thank you for our church family, our church building, Lord God. We thank you. We thank you this morning, God. As we approach this, this busy month, Lord God, of December, as we close out the year, but as we get also so busy with all the other stuff, Lord God, help us remember the main reason for, for Christmas, Lord God. Help us remember what this, this time of year is all about. I pray that we would set up the, the necessary boundaries, Lord God, so that we wouldn't be like that of the world, just busy with all the hustle and bustle and gifts and everything and forget about you. But I pray that we would remember the real reason for Christmas, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, there's different ways that we can put up on the, uh, the screens if possible. Uh, or for those of you that are watching online, those of you that are going to come in person, I see the, bus, the, um, the buckets are kind of hidden in behind our uh, nativity scene here at the front. But they are here, so you can come forward if that's the way you're going to do. Or else uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the digital ways to give as well. All right. Uh, our children are dismissed. You guys have uh, kids ministry. So you can go to the foyer there and find uh, Pastor Jose. All right. Okay. And then don't forget about those important dates next weekend. All right. We'll invite Apostle to come. Can we give a hand for Apostle as he comes? Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise offering this morning. Father, we thank you and praise you. We bless you. And it's time in the Word. Brought my big Bible today. My take, my, my takes Bible. I know you're in for the Word this morning. So good to see my sister there in the back. Sister used to come to the services here way back when we were in the old school building. And she's been around and she's traveled a bit. And, but we're glad to have her with us this morning. Amen. You know, uh, I've been so conflicted this morning. And uh, given the situation we find ourselves in in the world... You know, you, you, you come before a congregation like ours and, and, of course, the global congregation. And you wonder sometimes, where are people in their spiritual walk? And what is it that the Lord would have you say for him to them so that they don't become the casualties of the parables? I mean, we know the parables are wonderful, wonderful verses and wonderful communication of Jesus, but they have such a tragic side to them where Jesus says, you know, they say to Jesus, we have done this for you, we've done that for you, we've gone there for you, we fed, we clothed, we've done all these things for you. And the Bible says Jesus will say, depart from me, I don't know you, you workers of iniquity, and another translation says, you wicked. Uh, I think that's such a tragedy. And uh, you may get tired of me saying this, uh, but I don't mind saying it over and over because I shudder at the thought of standing before the Lord and the light being shone on my hands and there's somebody's blood on my hands. I want to make sure I don't stand before him with blood on my hands. But I want to go back to the gospel of St. John. Uh, and let's go to the beginning. Chapter 1. Last week, I think we were in chapter 6. Uh, and uh, this is why I said I was conflicted. Pastor Fionn almost preached my, my next sermon on the uh, faith under fire. That's what I was hoping to share, but I am not through with some of the thoughts there. 
But last week, uh, when I spoke to you, I spoke to you from the, uh, the topic or the idea of, how many of you can remember? Anybody remember what we spoke about last week, what I shared? John's Gospel, chapter 6. Remember the discourse of Jesus saying, will you also leave? I'm glad I was able to jog your memory. I thought for sure Sister Missessi was taking notes last week, and I know she would have the notes in a little book there. Uh, but today, uh, last week, we, we, we definitely covered some really, really important things for us to really, you know, pay attention to as far as uh, Jesus' admonitions to us. And today, I want to go to the topic of discipleship. Because in those parables, I think if we had to be honest with ourselves, the ones that Jesus speaks about that he refers to as wicked or workers of iniquity and he asks them to depart from him, uh, I don't believe are disciples per se. I believe they are followers at a distance. I believe they are attenders. I believe they are merely people who came for the fish and the loaves and wanted to see the miracles that he worked. But today I want to just look at the topic of discipleship because I believe in the day and age that we live in, it has lost its original place in what is considered contemporary church today. And uh, if we look all over the world, the great upheaval and the great gathering of, you know, peoples. So I want to go to John chapter 1, verses 35 uh, through 51 there. And again, I, like I said, I'm reading. I'm actually, I'm testing myself. Yeah, if anybody has a Dake's Bible, you'll know how small the writing is. So I'm going to give my eyes a good work over this morning. And you can look up at the screen as James gets John chapter 1 and verse 35. It says, again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold the Lamb of God. Have you noticed the songs we've been singing this morning? have all had a reference to the Lamb of God from the beginning, first song, uh, uh, right through till the end. And, he, and, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So let me just back up, because I think that's where we're going we're gonna to park ourselves this morning and really develop what I believe the Lord is wanting me to say to us this morning. Uh, to place this emphasis on that most and fundamental component of Christianity. And uh, we are always learning. Can you say we are always learning? Come on, I don't know that uh, we would have, you know, come to the end of learning. I think every day you wake up, you learn something. And uh, why don't we just do this before I go on and before my train of thought is lost. Uh, I know my son <laughs> and his family had uh, been really sick, and then I know Pastor Jose and Pastor Kenton have been struggling with the kids there. And I know this morning I got a text from uh, Regos, uh, but it's nice to see some of the kids here. But uh, let's pray for those within our family of faith here at uh, Bridge Ministry, as well as some of those that uh, some of you may know. Uh, uh, Pastor Sharon Bowden, and I want to just lift up. Can you just close your eyes, stretch your hands towards me as I stand in the gap? Lord, we want to pray for Solange and the family and the home that has been hit by this, whatever virus or flu or whatever this infirmity is or this affliction. We pray that you will drive it out from their house in Jesus' name. And Lord, for any other ones that call this church their home church, 
I pray now that the power of the cross be made available and experienced in that home and drive sickness, disease far from them in Jesus' name. We lift up our good friend, Pastor Sharon, and we ask that you touch her body. We pray that you drive out the disease that is attacking her body. And Lord, we give you praise because we know you hear us when we pray. We know you hear us when we pray. And so we lift up your servant, your handmaiden. Do the work that only you can do, I pray, in a situation. And everybody said? Everybody said? Amen is let it be so or so be it. All right, so the ministry of John the Baptist was to prepare the way. The ministry of John the Baptist was to prepare the way. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 says, He came to bear witness of the light. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness of the light. And you're going to see where I'm going. I want to develop the idea here this morning that all of us carry the same sort of mandate, if you would, or the same purpose as John the Baptist. And uh, that's why I want to call our time together in the word, come and see. Say it with me, come and see. You'll see why I'm, I'm, you know, saying come and see. All right, let me get back to verse 38. Uh, Verse 38 says, Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said, this is the two guys now, they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, or being interpreted, Master, another translation will say, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? Where dwellest thou? Verse 39 says, He said unto them, Come and see. Come and see. When's the last time you saw you you told somebody, come and see what God can do in your family. Come and see what God can do in your life. Come and see what God can do in your marriage. Come and see what God can do for you. So Jesus says, come and see where I'm dwelling. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Verse 41, of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. Verse 41, he first findeth his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, We have found Messiah. Come on, say it with me. We have found Messiah. Now, if, if we really, really believe that with all our heart, and like, you know, I had the, the, the intention there to interrupt the worship today as we were singing, you know, about, Lord, I will give you all my worship. Lord, uh, I'll give you all my praise. You know, we live such busy lives, and we are interacting with people at different states, stages of our week, And oftentimes we need to stop and think and pause for a moment during our weekly goings and comings. Are we still giving God all our worship? Are we still giving him all our praise? Or do we come upon a situation where we heap our praise on something else or somebody else or, or, you know, We start to embellish something, some event or some activity that happened. We start giving praise to that. And we just lost that place where we said, I will give you all. Now you've just taken the all, you've taken a chunk of that and you've given it to something else. But let's keep going. Uh, Verse 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Now, you know, people use this word as a swear word. You know, when they take a hammer and they uh, hand nailing something and they hit their finger, uh, you know, and it's painful, they'll use, you know, Jesus Christ as a cuss word. Uh, But yeah, we can see it's more than that. 
verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find it Philip and said unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Verse 45, Philip findeth Nathan and said unto him, or Nathaniel, and said unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathan, or Nathaniel, said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. And that come and see still permeates down through the corridors of time and right up to where we are right now. And, and it goes on here, it says, come and see. In verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. And Nathanael said unto him, whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. In verse 50, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I say unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. Say it with me, please. Greater things than these I shall see. <laughs> okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. Greater I shall see. Make it emphatic. Believe that you shall see greater things. And, 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 and the context or the reference point is, you've seen great things already. And today we're making a fresh declaration that I will see greater things than I've already seen. Yes, bless God for 2023, but we're pulling the curtains on 2023 with all its greatness and with all its sadness, with all its valleys and disappointments, there is greatness that still lies ahead. Can you say amen? Come on, say a real live amen. Amen. This is you we're talking about, and this is me I'm talking about. I shall see great things. I'm going to see great things. I thought when I had my first child, that was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. You have six, okay. Are you still with me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto you, I, see, I saw you under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily. Notice, every time a word is repeated like that twice, uh, our brothers and sisters from the English uh, origin tell us that is in what they would call an emphatic state or place. It's like when you take a pen and I marked, can you see some of it I've marked, uh, when you underline something because you, it's, a, it's a point, it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a place you want to remember, all right? Uh, he says, verily, verily, pay attention, pay attention, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God uh, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you today is the day you've made. And we thank you for the wonderful privilege we have of sitting around your word and finding out more about who you are and who we are in you. Can you everybody say amen? amen? So it starts off with John the Baptist, who we know his story is one who came before Jesus. 
Yes, he paved the way, per se. He prepared a way. And uh, we are here. Yeah, um, John indeed bore witness of Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 29 of John chapter 1, and we're going to go through lots of scripture here again, as always. And uh, I uh, want to make sure that you get enough word so that you can stand after having done all stand. So we can see even in this context, there's a promise of greater things. And it's when we allow the word of God to really have its way, and if I can use this word, play or outworking in our lives, we begin to see these kind of things that Jesus is telling Philip here. Greater things than these you're going to see. Now, a lot of us are, are, are not willing to, to, to make the word of God our priority, but... We want to cherry pick the things we want, like greater, greater works than these you shall do. And yeah, in this reference, uh, he's promising that uh, this ordinary man that was minding his own business, he's going to see even greater things. And so you can see it is a promise of God for us to see greater things, but it's not for us to to be so preoccupied with the greater things and forget the lesser things, uh, if I can use that term. Uh, and, and the lesser things here yeah, is the things that lead up to the greater things. And it's come and see. Come follow me and you'll see great things. Amen? So the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and the Son of God who baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Okay, this is all leading up to uh, verses 35 to 51. So we can see the promise here of those greater things has a contingency or it has a condition. Uh, let me rephrase it. It has a condition. Uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 32 through 34 says, And bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So John the Baptist is giving testimony of the one that he has gone before, that he's the one you need to be looking to now, not me. John done all these wonderful signs and wonders in the, you know, in the desert, and people followed him and flocked to him, and he caused all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, problems for the, uh, the, you know, the, the religious leaders, yes, and as well as the, you know, the civic leaders, the, the, the government leaders, uh, to the point that they had to, he had to lose his head in their words. But he's the one who bears witness and points us to Jesus because if we're going to see these great things or greater things, it's not through some personality like John the Baptist, but it's going to be through Jesus. Implicitly following him with all our hearts. And due to this testimony, this witness of John the Baptist, Jesus began to attract disciples. How are we going to get disciples? How is Jesus going to get more people following him is by people like you and I witnessing. Does that make sense? It looks simple, right? It says, yeah, due to the testimony of John the Baptist, people began to be attracted to Jesus. So our testimony, our witness for Jesus is ultra important you, you notice the other thing about what we were seeing this morning, all about how holy forever he is. He's holy forever. And if you and I want to be, you know, true witnesses in the earth, then our lives must be a life that causes people to be attracted to Jesus. 
I wrote this down in my notes here. I wonder sometimes if because of our testimony, our witness, people can't follow Jesus. I wonder. I'm just thinking out aloud. Is it possible that you, me, us, the way we conduct our lives out in the world, in our neighborhoods, uh, you know, when they hear all the screaming in our house and see the cat running out the house, when we kicking the cat and, you know, and throwing things through the window and people say, if that's Christianity, if those are followers of Jesus, I don't want any of that. Amen? That makes sense. So the first disciples were those who had been disciples of John. Verse 35 and 36. Again the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus, as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. John didn't have a problem of insecurity or immaturity. And because of that testimony, these two guys began to follow. 37 through 39 says, The two, two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. I know, and, and this is why I'm, I'm preparing something for the next time I get to share with you. The, the faith, our faith, is under fire. Across the nations of the world, it's not just, you know, uh, in some little locality where we're seeing persecution of the church and Christians, but globally right now, there's this persecution, there's this challenge to our faith. And so what it has inadvertently done in some places, it has caused us in free countries to be silent. I don't know if you heard that one song we sang up there, the praise song, I won't be silent. I can't keep quiet over because of what's inside of me. We got to tell. However, will these people ever know that there's a God who loves them and has a wonderful plan for their lives if we don't tell them? We must make a conscious effort. We must make an intentional effort. We must make an effort beyond the effort we have made in the past. We have to get to this place of urgency where we see the windows of time or the curtains of time being closed. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, what do you seek? They said, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated teacher, where are you staying? When's the last time somebody uh, was so impressed with your life? your lifestyle, your life conduct, that they want to know more about you. They want to know, uh, why are you the way you are? Where can I, you know, uh, get what you got? How can I become like you, basically? He said to them, come and see. And I don't know when last... Uh, you had that wonderful occasion to be able to say to somebody, come and see. Come and see that the Lord is good. Come and see what God has in store for you. Not an eternal, you know, uh, an eternity without him, but an eternity with him. They came and they saw where he was staying and they remained with him. So great was the impact on their lives that they stayed through, ten, to, through to the 10th. Uh, well, it says it was the 10th hour and they stayed the whole day with him. Now, I want to quickly look at the testimony of these two brothers. 
their background firstly. Andrew in verse 44 there, uh, from Bethsaida of Galilee, and Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So it looks like these old guys, these whole three guys here that are giving testimony or that are being impacted by the life of Jesus and pointed by John to Jesus, uh, the whole three of them came from the same locality. Verse 42 of John's gospel, chapter 1, he says, And uh, he brought him to Jesus, the brother of Simon Peter. He brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon Peter, son of Jonah. You shall now be called Cephas, the stone. And we see another reference uh, to him in Matthew 4, 18. He is looked upon as a fisherman. And if you know anything about fishermen back then, they weren't the best, you know, smelling people. They weren't probably the best dressed people. Uh, but look what it says. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And we can see, yeah, from John's gospel, what we read already, 35 to 40, how uh, he's, he's called by, by Jesus to apostleship, firstly to discipleship and then to apostleship. And so we read here, again the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus, he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. What an amazing testimony they must have had in the community that they would just leave what they were doing to follow Jesus. Can I challenge us this morning? Can I provoke us this morning to, to take every opportunity? You don't know when you will die. I don't know when I will die. I don't have the date and time. But could we make a conscious effort? A couple of weeks ago when we returned from uh, Barbados, we thanked you for praying for us, and we shared with you how on that small island nation we were able to go into a mall and just about preach to everybody. They're, you know, it's just like... People are open because of all the trouble that is upon the face of the earth. People are looking for an answer. People are looking for hope. And you and I are the carriers of hope. Even this Christmas, people will set aside all their differences and, and all their problems with each other. And, and, and the commercial world will bring them all together, take all their money away from them, Leave them broke by January, but all in the name of Jesus. Sister was telling me that I should let my hair, uh, you know, just be natural. And I said, if I let it go between now and Christmas, then I will require everybody to call me Father Christmas. Because I'll have a white beard and a white mop. Right, sister? Yeah. Two brothers, minding their own business, but were so impacted by John and John's testimony of pointing to Jesus. The next day, John stood with two of his disciples. The two disciples heard him speak. They followed Jesus. Then Jesus turns and says to them, What do you seek? They say to him, Which... Uh, he, where are you staying? He says, come and see. They came and they saw where you were staying and remained with him that day. One of the two heard John speak and followed him. He was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. So this also happened in a place called Bethabra. John chapter 1 verse 28 there. It says, these things were done in Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. So it almost looks to me like there wasn't a place that his reach or his influence couldn't reach. And it should be the same with us. I mean, now we have the advent of the internet uh, with all its opportunities 
opportunities to be able to reach further than our street and further than our community, let's make sure we do it. If you have an online presence, use it for the Lord Jesus. And can I just, I don't know if I'll offend any of you here, but uh, it bothers me sometimes when I see my own family, and I know I'll get a couple of texts because they watch. Yeah, I have a problem with people wishing grandma happy heavenly birthday. Like, why didn't you wish her happy birthday when she was here? Now she's dead and gone, and you... And that goes to other people that we always wishing happy heavenly. I mean, I don't know how that makes you feel. The same amount of words you use to wish happy heavenly birthday, can you just put up a scripture there and point people to Jesus? Come on, help me spread the word of love and hope this Christmas. You know, we have, a, we have that lunch coming next week. I don't think it should just be for this church to come after Sunday morning service and sit down and eat. We should invite somebody, somebody that's not churched, somebody that doesn't go to church regularly. Come next week Sunday and bring them for a meal and let them see, come and see. We are ordinary people like you. We have gotten such a bad rap for being uh, uh, disconnected and and and. and you know, what's the other word, Pastor Norman? Hypocrites and uh, bigots. And they call us all these kind of words. Well, bring some of them. Let them come and see. We take a fork and a knife of food and we put it down the same way they put it. I don't see anybody doing feeding themselves through their ear. But that's how simple it is to share the gospel. People love food. People love free food. Don't have to go far to see how many people love free food. Don't even have to go to Africa or India or some third world country, right? Yeah, in Saskatoon. They love free food. So can we do that this, this Sunday? Only me and Eleanor, three of us. Can, can you invite one person, please? And if you're inviting one person, would you let the office know you invited one person so we can cook enough food for everybody? Can we do that? This let, 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 Let's make this Sunday coming our very best Sunday. Come dressed up. I'm amazed always when people go to graduations and, and then it's Valentine's. Hey, they just really put on the Ritz boy. But when they come to church, it's just like, let me see. Oh, it's not there. Where is it? It's in the, it's in the basket. Let me go to the washing basket. Oh, there's it. And then they show up in church, all crinkle cut, and we have to iron you out. Come on. Let's put our best foot forward this week. There's a men's uh, uh, free breakfast. Uh, normally the men meet at 8 or 8.30. They pushed it back to 9 o'clock this Saturday so that those of us who like to just sleep an extra hour, we can all make it. Let's invite a man to the men's thing. The women are meeting on Saturday afternoon. Let's invite a, a, you know, a lady on Saturday afternoon. Let's try to reach out. Let's be the John Baptists of today. Let's bring people to Jesus and tell them, come and see. Because all the reports you heard about us are not true. It's fabrication. Fake news is alive. How many of you know that? If I had to get a dollar or even a penny, we were actually just talking the other day. If I had to get 29 cents for every time somebody said a bad thing about me, good Lord, I'd be a billionaire. And it hasn't stopped me. I just keep preaching, keep teaching. So something the other disciple was John or the apostle but he stayed with Jesus that day. He said to them, come and see. They came, they saw, and they, was, and they came and stayed with him. 
Later, Jesus officially calls them to be his disciples. These same guys, look at Matthew 4, 18 through 20. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon Peter, uh, called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net, they were, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me. The call was given. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Well, beloveds, if we're going to follow Jesus this Christmas, remember, Jesus is not in this little nativity scene here. Jesus lives in your heart and lives in my heart, and he wants to live in other people's hearts also by his Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? So, verse 12 of Matthew 4 there, after John was cast into prison, now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he left Galilee. And then he was selected to be one of the 12, the names here, Matthew 10, 20, uh, chapter two, uh, verse 2, sorry. It says, the names of the 12 apostles, these were first Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brothers. You can see the, the sequence of events that lead up to his calling to be an apostle. Jesus, we can see a Matt, uh, sorry, John's Gospel, chapter 6, where we were last week, verses 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Wow. What are they among so many? He was, he was already looking for a way out. And we know what Jesus done with that little happy meal of that young man. Ma Ma Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, the question here uh, about uh, Jesus poses to them about the destruction of, of Jerusalem. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, notice uh, we're talking about discipleship, said to him, teacher, see what men of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be overthrown or thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives up opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will all these things be and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Well, we know that these things were fulfilled, uh, you know, after they had expired. But Acts chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 also. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Now, we know this, that his mother was Joanna, who was of one of the tribes of Reuben, but we know a disciple first of John the Baptist, and then Jesus. And then Jesus reveals his spiritual character as one who is willing to serve God. He is a rock. He is a stone. He is somebody who's going to be solid. Can you say amen? So when we look at Simon Peter here, we can see his background from Bethsaida. He's the brother of Andrew. Uh, he's a fisherman. This is all his qualifications for discipleship and then eventually apostleship. John chapter 1 verses 40 through 42, which we've read already. But we look here also in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, verse 28, these things were done in Bethabara, where John was baptizing, where Jesus named him Cephas, the Aramaic word there, uh, and then the Greek word meaning a rock. Now, I want to just say this for those of you and those of us who may feel like, you know, you're losing uh, traction as a, as a child of God and, you know, things haven't been going your way and uh, you just feel cold and indifferent or you're feeling not as fired up as you used to. Never allow your feelings to dictate your future. The greatest lesson you can learn in this life 
And the reason I say that is because feelings are temporal. They don't last. You wake up in the morning, you're mad at everybody. Somebody shows you some kindness through the day, and your feelings can change. Somebody comes and drop a thousand dollars in your hand, and your anger and fit just disappears. Amen? Isn't that the truth? So you cannot trust feelings because feelings will sabotage your future. You have to stand on the word of God. What does God say about me? Jesus is that rock. He's the chief cornerstone. Our, our first peoples, uh, they understand chieftainship. And Jesus is our chief cornerstone. And we can stand upon him when the storms are coming, when the storms have abated, when the storms are high, when the storms are low. If we stand on what he says, we will never be put to shame. Can you say amen? God, I've had so much in this life, this short life of mine, this young life of mine. And had I not been in Christ, I would have probably committed spiritual suicide by now. Because sometimes the world can be very, very cruel. But you cannot, you simply cannot write the world off because of a few cruel encounters you've had. You have to look to the one who created all there is. The one who calls you the darling. The one who calls you the apple of his eye. The one who woke you up this morning. The one who allows you to breathe every day. Look to him. That's who I look to. We can see a long history here, how, how the Lord called Simon into discipleship and then into apostleship. But so often today, we have a problem of staying the course in discipleship. I'm grateful for the guys who've gone before me, who took the time to mentor and disciple, disciple me. Give me the time of day and answer my awkward questions and uh, put up with all my zealous idiosyncrasies that I had as a young Christian. Little fits of anger and little fits of, you know. But look where I am today because they wanted to me to be the best that I can be. You know, Simon Peter, we can see, ends up in the inner circle of Jesus' close-knit. At his final hours, he's there. From a simple fisherman, from a man that would not be given a second look by others, He received a bad rap, and sometimes that's all we remember of Peter. Or he denied Jesus. He's a denier. Well, to be honest with you, there are many Peters out there every day. In the church as well. We jump onto trains that we have no business jumping onto. And by our actions and our conduct, we, are, we become deniers for a moment. And then we leave that train and we come back to the gospel train and then we uh, put on the act all over again. But if we are disciples, disciples are not, you know, let me put it this way. We are so busy trying to make belongers and not believers. 
And I, I would that more of us would give ourselves to making believers out of non-believers. And the best way to do that is to walk them through the Bible. I know when I got saved, uh, the very first 24 hours I got saved, somebody was in my home loving on me, comforting me, walking me through the scriptures. Within 48 hours, some others were in my home making sure that I'm not going to be lost, teaching me this newfound life. Today, somebody comes to Christ, and it's so hard to find people who will walk with that person. Make sure within the first 24 hours, they have a connection in the kingdom. And it's partly why so many turn away. Peter becomes a very, very key figure in the first half of the book of Acts. We know, according to historical, he supposedly died a martyr's death in Rome. The wealth of information about Peter in the Gospels and the Acts reveal the power of the Gospel to tra transform a simple flawed man into a rock of discipleship. And that's what I want my life to be, a rock of discipleship. I want it to be said when they're burying me, I want them to be announcing all the wonderful things that perhaps my life has, has uh, been able to you know, experience, but I want them to be able to say he was a rock of discipleship. He died a disciple of Jesus. Not a dependent, but a disciple. That should be all our prayer. That in the, in the unlikely event, you know, I am burying you. And I am doing your final moments. And your casket sits here. I don't want to have to be telling the people about all the glorious manifestations of God's activity that we've seen in, his, in, in your life, but more so that this person was a rock in spite of all the onslaught of persecution and accusations falsely. They were a rock, just like Peter. Amen? Amen? That's what I would hope you would want me to do. Because, you know, I come from a traditional church background where if you paid the spiritual leader enough money, you would have a high service. And then I'll embellish and say, what a wonderful person you was. You had this wavy brown hair that would blow every time you got too close to the fan. And your smile just lit up the building. And You know, I love those dimples when you would, you know, grin. And if you gave me an extra 10,000, I would say all those wonderful things. But if you didn't, then I'd just say, well, we're not sure where they're going. They, they seem to have a form of godliness. We'd see them once every six months, you know. We're not 100%, uh, you know, because they weren't 100% uh, in attendance. I don't think any, any preacher should be put in that position. We as the leaders and preachers, we should be so gloriously ready to give an account for the lives that have been entrusted to us that we start with saying, Liz Palak was a rock of discipleship. I know her for since 19, eight, between 1983, 84, 85, all the way to now. I want to be able to say one thing I, 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 I know about Liz over these last three decades that I know her. 
She was a woman of the word. Now, everybody else knows every other wonderful thing about her. More power to you. But me, as a man of God, as a man of the word, I have to get you to that place where your light shines. It's unmistakable where you gone. I don't have to make excuses. I'm not sure if you made it to heaven. Uh, maybe you in purgatory waiting. Uh, maybe a, you know, a, a slashing of your sentence or something. No. I'm going to be un, unapologetically saying, I know this person. They were truly. They were not a belonger. They were a believer. They were not a dependent. They were a disciple of God. They patterned their life after Jesus, just like Peter patterned his life after Jesus. Amen? We, when we look at another one here, he immediately tells Nathaniel about Jesus. Verses 45 and 46. So Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. So it doesn't take a whole lot of, you know, Bible jargon. You just got to just tell them the basics. Come and see. Say it with me this morning again. Come and see. You know, in, in, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, you know the story of Zacchaeus, right? Verses 1 through 10 there. What's the one thing that got Zacchaeus' attention? The Bible says he wanted to see who Jesus was. This is a respectable man. Well, respectable in the worldly sense. <laughs> Chief tax collector. He's not a respectable man in any sense of, of, of the Bible. But in his community, he was looked up to. He had a very responsible job. He, you know, he was the chief of all the tax collectors. Philip says he has found him of whom Moses and the prophet spoke or wrote. And he invites skeptical Nathaniel. So, we don't have a choice who we invite to come and see. Oh, no, my neighbor will never. Oh, no, I know my, my, uh, my cousin will never, you know, enter the doors of a church. Don't give up on people so easily. Yeah, I mean, yes, Philip, uh, of all people, <laughs> And anybody that knew John, uh, uh, Peter, knew he was a temperamental person. Yet Peter's life so changed that it caused others to turn to Jesus, to want to follow Jesus. And yet we have a point in case where Philip is so moved, he's so impacted, he's got to tell brother Nathaniel, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. That's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David. But today, there's not much teaching, preaching, exhorting, instructing about you and I going back to the original. And this is going back to the original. By going back to John chapter 1, we want to find out why it is so that these three men were so impacted that they led others and pointed others to Jesus to have an unbelievable transformation. Now, if I had to pick a topic like this Sunday we're going to do, which is, I mean, I'm, I'm all for it, and we've done it, and we'll probably still do it, but uh, if I had to pick a topic and post it live all over and invest money in, you know, we're going to be uh, doing a series on finances and how you can get rich. I remember there was a... There was a one of our teachers in high school. I did make it to high school. 
And uh, one of the set books he gave us was Think and Grow Rich. And this guy was so on that, and he wasn't very kind to those of us who never read the book. I mean, I wasn't a very avid reader, not that I am now, but I have the book now. The book, the Bible, not Think and Grow Rich book. I know if I have the Bible, and I understand the Bible, and read the Bible, and study the Bible, I can grow rich. Because the Bible tells me it is God's will for you and me to be in good health and prosper as our souls prosper. He gives us, uh, Deuteronomy tells us, gives us power to obtain wealth. Now, not everybody's happy when you obtain wealth or you get wealth. But that shouldn't stop you. But the point is, if I had to, if I had to really advertise, we will probably get more ears and more hits and more views. But people don't want to go back to the word. And 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 I and I already announced and advertised that I'm going to be doing a series <laughs> uh, from the book of Proverbs, right from chapter one all the way through. And on the wisdom principles found in the book of Proverbs. Because I think there's a lot of people who make foolish decisions and foolish mistakes that, di that they didn't have to make, but they made them. Because they're not wise. Not wise in handling their money, not wise in handling their families, not wise in handling other relationships. And the book of Proverbs covers every area of life. And so I want to do that in the new year. We'll probably just give you a Zoom key. We'll do it just privately, and then hopefully we can put it out on YouTube. But we want to do the wisdom keys, uh, the successful keys to life. So Philip says, come and see. And we can see uh, Luke chapter 6, 13 and 14. He is selected to be one of the 12 apostles. And when, he, when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And, and from, from them, he chose 12. And he also named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip. You can see these whole three guys end up in the apostolic team of Jesus. So, it begs the question... What is our task now as we see the soon approaching of Jesus? Remember the question he posed, will I find, come on, help me, when I return, will I find faith? Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to who? He said to Philip. He addresses Philip. He says, Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him because Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do with that happy meal that little boy had. These are testimonies of ordinary people who were able to do the right thing, who were impacted by the life of John, yes, but also the life of Jesus. By following Jesus, they were able, and they got the promise that they will do greater things than these. Philip got that promise. John chapter 12, verses 20 through 22, it says, Now there were certain Greeks among those whom came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to who? They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So, come and see Philip. Come and see Nathaniel. Come and see the Messiah. The one who Moses spoke about attracts people who want to see who Jesus is. 
there's so many people out there and we think that we are limited to the amount of people who want to see. We're not limited. It is unlimited the amount of people who need to see who Jesus is. And we got a part to play. Firstly, make sure that we're not an impediment. We're not a hindrance to people coming to see who Jesus is. We need to make sure our lives reflect the values that Jesus expects of us through his word. Amen? If I'm always cussing, if I, my lifestyle is, you know, heavy partying and I'm, you know, got this lifestyle that is offensive to people, uh, why would people want to come and see who Jesus is? They see you, you, you and me. That's who they're looking I'm always amazed at uh, some of the communities that are arising now. This, these communities that have alternative nouns to their names and all this. And I'm always amazed at how they, they're so starved for love. And when they protest, that's all they talk about, love. You cannot truly experience love until you come to God who is love. He's the creator of love. He is the one who understands love better than any of us. And until you experience that love, that love of forgiveness of your sin, you'll never be able to share love. The thing they call love is lust. The thing we call love is sacrifice. You have to love somebody even though you don't agree with them. You don't, may not agree with their lifestyle, their conduct, their behavior, their ethnicity, their you know, social standing. You may not agree with that. But you have one, one commitment that is required of you as a believer, as a follower of Jesus. You are to love. Can you say amen? And it's kind of like one of those one of those debts you have to pay that, you know, you can never, the moment you pay it up, you get an opportunity to love again. So it's, an, it's a, you, you'll never get to that place where you say, well, I've loved enough for one lifetime. No, you haven't. Some of us haven't even begun to love. We love the people who love us. We love the people who give us nice accolades, pats on the backs. Oh, you're looking so fine today. Oh, I saw your car. You're driving a nice car. Oh, you live in a nice neighborhood. Uh, we love those kind of people who always say nice things to us. What about the people who call you bigot and call you hypocrite and call you, you know, uh, Bible bashers and Bible thumpers? You've got to love them. That's what we are called to do. Because when I look across the church, there's some people that if I wasn't a Christian, <laughs> I would want to have nothing to do with them. Remember what Jesus said about hypocrites? But anyhow, let's keep going quickly. So invitation of Philip to Nathaniel, come and see, is an illustration of personal evangelism. We must, we must bring people to see. So we have, a, we have a mandate this week to try to find as many people as we can to invite to our lunch next Sunday, our breakfast men on Saturday, and our women's closing on Saturday afternoon. I see my wife's looking at me. Is 12 o'clock. Now, let me quickly give you a couple, uh, John 21, verses 2. Simon Peter Thomas called the twin Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee. You can see uh, Nathaniel is getting, you know, accolades here. Uh, he's called to discipleship. Verse 45 of chapter 1, Philip and found Nathaniel, said to him, we have found him. And of course, you know, then Nathaniel was at first skeptical. Can any good come out of Saskatoon? Virgie, can any good come out of Manila? (laughs) 
Michelle, can any good come out of Jamaica? You better believe there's good everywhere. It's like mines. There is mines to be mined. Diamonds in the rough. Can any good come out of northern Saskatchewan? A thousand times, yes. Don't write us off. Our final story and our final chapter has not been written. All God has written it, but the world has not yet begun to even experience our final chapter. Can you say amen? Come on, look at somebody who says he's talking about you. So he was skeptical. Can any good come out? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Will the Christ come out of Galilee? That's what some others said, yeah? Uh, John 7, 41. Uh, this is the Christ, but some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? They question. And that's what's happening in our world today. They question whether you and I can actually be representatives, ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God's ambassadors in these kind of bodies, these kind of colors. We're myriad of colors, myriad of tongues. This is what is the problem for so many people. They have a preset kind of idea of how uh, uh, the kingdom of God should look and who it should come from and, and why uh, it, it should disqualify certain people groups or certain people's uh, colors and people's uh, tongues. That's why I'm so glad Jesus has the final say. Can you say final say? It's not up to you. It's not up to me. It's not up to any of these people. Uh, yeah, people can say all they want to say. Jesus convinces Nathaniel. Yeah, look here, he says, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming towards him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom no, de no deceit or no guile. And Nathaniel says to him, How do you know me? Now, Jesus is operating in the word of knowledge here. Yeah. And every one of us who have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, we need to cultivate in this hour the gift of the word of knowledge, the gift of the discerning of spirits. We live in an evil day. We live in a wicked day. But we should have the edge all the time by allowing the Holy Ghost. Look what Nathaniel said to him. How do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip even called you, I saw you sitting under the tree. I saw you sitting under the tree. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And it's supposed to be a heathen. This supposed to be a non-believing person. All of a sudden, his interaction with Jesus causes a transformation. That now his confession, he goes from, can anything good come out? Now, all of a sudden, you are the Christ. You are the king of kings. You are son of God. That's what's waiting to happen through our lives to so many. And they will never be able to get to that place where they confess him if we don't get up and do something. Does that make sense? Identifying him as an, Israel, uh, as an Israelite in whom there's no deceit or no guile. Telling uh, Nathaniel how he saw him sitting under the fig tree before Philip called him. I don't know, but perhaps Jesus saw him engage in private devotion. But I'd like to believe that Jesus saw him. Remember what, what John chapter 5 and verse 19 and John chapter 5 verse 30 says about, about Jesus. Jesus says this. He says, I don't say anything unless I hear my father saying it. I don't do anything unless I see what my father is doing. So Jesus had this ability to see in the spirit and to hear in the spirit. So it is possible that he was moving in the gift and he saw Nathaniel. And he also heard Nathaniel's skeptical comment. And I think that must have really scared Nathaniel also. It's like, whoa, this guy before Philip even came to talk to me, he saw me sitting under the tree. So that means when I was doubting and being skeptical, can any good come out of Nazareth? He must have heard those words too. It's always amazing when you are in the spirit and you can read 
what the Spirit is giving you. Prompting Nathaniel to proclaim, truly, truly, verily, verily, you are the king of Israel. So Nathaniel is convinced, and Jesus promises Nathaniel greater blessings due to his faith. What do you think he has promised for us? And can I, can I just throw this into your preparation for Christmas? He promises us equally great things. This was almost 2,000 years ago he promised Nathaniel that. We are now in this New Testament church and New Testament believers. You better believe that God has something greater. What he says to him, heaven opening and angels of God ascending and descending upon him. Wow. Isn't that powerful? You know what he's doing here? Genesis chapter 28. This ladder that went up to heaven and came down, angels going up and down, that's the illusion here of Joseph's dream or Jacob's dream. So we can see according to these accounts of Simon, Peter, his brother Andrew, and Philip, who then calls, you can see there's this progression, and that's what needs to happen. I think we need to get back to that place. Let's stand, and let's get back to that place where we take our positions up again. You know, especially in light of us uh, being around this wonderful Christmas theme and Christmas time, prepare, preparing, coming out of Thanksgiving, coming out of Yom Kippur. Uh, we need to make a fresh commitment. Lord, lead me to somebody that I can invite for lunch this Sunday. Lead me to somebody that I can invite for breakfast on Saturday. Lord, lead me to somebody that I could invite for the ladies' luncheon at 12 on Saturday. Please don't stay away if you're not doing anything. Please don't just sit at home and watch TV or idle. Come and have fellowship. It's not going to be raining this weekend. Now, if you're wondering if I've got a degree in weather, what do you call that, Norman? No, it's not going to snow. I sent the snow to the next province over. And I know the Lord hears me. I'm sorry, snow will come the week after. But right now, invite somebody to our gatherings. Don't stay away. Be there. I'm almost tempted to stay on after Saturday's breakfast and don't look at me like that. I just said I'm tempted. I didn't say I'm staying after. Gosh, that look could melt a whole iceberg. It was like fire coming out of your eyes. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning as we look at the lies of Peter, his brother Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, these simple men who became so empowered by coming to Christ. Lord, we are but simple people also. You brought us from all different backgrounds. Ultimately, we are your creation, the work of your hands. And so this morning, Lord, even as we conclude our service and round your word, we ask this morning that a fresh wind, a renewal, <clears throat> a stirring, begin to happen in our hearts and lives and that we walk with intention and that you touch our ears, anoint our ears that we may hear what the Spirit is saying to all the people that we pass daily. Let it end today that we let anybody pass us that perhaps you were speaking to us to interact with them. Help us to listen to the Spirit for divine connections, divine interactions, divine interruptions. Touch today every one of us, all our families, 
here and abroad. <clears throat> Lord, I think of our kids who are studying abroad out from this city. We pray your blessing upon them, your protection as they make preparation to come home for Christmas. Lord, for those who perhaps aren't here this morning and maybe are feeling the effects of the switch and the change, and just know that the devil is at work trying to put sickness on different ones. Lord, I thank you that you cover us like Pastor Fiona said this morning. You protect us. I plead your blood upon our lives here afresh. And Lord, I speak blessing going forward, going out, sitting down, rising up, coming in. I speak blessing in the city. I speak blessing in the field. Thank you, Lord. We are rising to our full potential. Thank you that we are conquerors. Thank you that we are overcomers. Thank you that we are unstoppable. And we bless your name for it. And everybody said, Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Please give the Lord a big clap offering as you make your way.